Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father, we thank you for this new day, Lord. We thank you that that, that uh, ballistic missile uh, alert yesterday was just a, was a false alarm. But Lord, we just pray that you would use it to stimulate revival, Lord, in, in the state of Hawaii this morning and, and around the world, Lord. And we just pray that you would use this time, Lord, to feed your sheep, Lord, to help us all draw closer to you. Use Pastor Izzy now. Pray that you'd keep the distractions away, Lord. Let us cast all of our cares at your feet and put our eyes to you. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, guys, that verse that Aaron was just alluding to in Ecclesiastes, it's in Ecclesiastes 7. It says, it's better for you to be in a house of mourning, a funeral, than in a house of feasting. It says, and, but it tells us why. The next verse says, because this is the end of every person. When we go to a funeral, we, we're faced with our mortality. And just like yesterday's uh, threat of, uh, of the ballistic missile coming toward us, um, you know, People, I, I saw a huge disparity of reaction. I mean, wasn't it interesting how the difference in the reactions of the believers versus the ones who don't know the hope that we have? I mean, I saw the, even the newscaster on KITV, the, the, you know, the big guy, um, sorry, I want to say, Drew, what, what, what's his name? Someone said it over there. He, he, he's Robert, Robert Kikawa. He, he was, it, it freaked him out. You know, it just, like, he kept thinking, but what? 38 minutes, what took so long, you know? And then for the rest of the day, it just, it just, it, it rattled his cage. It, you could see it visibly rattle him, this idea that a, a, a ballistic missile could be heading toward us. And, you know, it's, it, it is something that if you don't have the hope of the faith that we share, you know, my daughter asked me yesterday, my, little, my youngest one, Raquel, came and sat in my lap and she, she was a little scared. She's like, Dad, how come you're so calm? And I'm like, look, honey, if this is, truly, if this is the worst day we're going to die, as a believer, it's actually my best day. Because then it's over, and I finished the race, and I fought the good fight, and I get to go to be to heaven today. And, you know, this is not, to me, just something I tell you as, like, a fable or a fairy tale. I hope we all go to heaven, you know, like it's some kind of pipe dream or something. This is a reality. Heaven is real. When the, when the disciples were with Jesus, Jesus led Peter, James, and John up to a mountain before he was crucified. And it says that Moses and Elijah came to speak to Jesus. How many remember the, the story of the Mount of Transfiguration in the Gospel? And as Jesus was there, Peter, James, and John got to see. Here's, now, how anyone would volunteer if we had a time machine to go, to go with them on this day? I mean, okay, because what happens, right? Moses and Elijah appear, it says, in radiant white. Their bodies are in the glorified state, we would say. They're not in their earthly bodies. They've already died hundreds, thousands of years earlier, but they are now alive. And this shows you that after we die, do we really die? No. These guys show up to Jesus, and, they, and they're there, it says, comforting him because he's about to go to the cross. Something really cool happens, though. While Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah, what happened to Jesus' physical body? Anyone remember the story? It says it changed. It went from this earthly shell to it was radiant and white and glorified. And they were, <laughs> to say the least, a little freaked out. I mean, I'm just putting it in our vernacular. They were like, Peter's like, <gasps> Lord, it's a good thing we were here. We got to build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And, you know, we've got to remember, this is the day we got to see. They got to see something that, honestly, I believe if we saw it, we'd, we'd probably come up with some similar idea. Hey, Lord, we should do something about this. This was a big day. What was the big deal? The big deal was they saw two fellows that had died long, long time before patriarchs, heroes of the Jewish faith, we'd say, 
You got Moses who represents the law. You got Elijah who represents the prophets. They got the two, what we, in, in Jewish culture, this is like the kingpins of the Jewish culture. The, the law and the prophets represented. And they showed up and those guys got to see. Could anyone ever here wondered what's life like after death? You know, what will we look like? Will we really be there, you know? How would you, anyone volunteer to go with me and see Moses and Elijah? on that mountain, on that day, and then watch Jesus go from the earthly body that he had taken on. It says he humbled himself to come to this earth and to be born as a baby. And some people, they actually like mock this. In fact, a lot of Arab states, they mock the gospel because they said, isn't it stupid God would make himself a baby? That's their mockery. Why, why did he humble himself and become a baby? Why didn't he just show up as a grown man? Why didn't he show up as a grown man shining white? You know, like Moses and Elijah that day, and, and like he changed before them. Why didn't he show up like that? Well, what would we have done? <laughs> Probably run. Ah! You know, ghost or something. It would freak us out. But when he comes as a baby, we're like, oh, cute. <laughs> I mean, I was over there at mine and their baby. I'm like, look at this cute little baby. She's over there in the nursery right now. But, but like, I mean, when you see a baby, it's just like not threatening. You're like, oh, approachable. And that's what Jesus did. He made God approachable to man. But he didn't leave us without a hope of what's coming next. Peter, James, and John got to see the hope what comes next. They got to see the hope of life after death right before their eyes. Now, what was Jesus' words to those three men? Keep this what? Shh, mum's the word. Keep this quiet till after I leave. You don't get to go tell everyone this. You get to see it. You don't get to tell everyone till after I'm gone. Why? Can you imagine the stir it would have made? If they would, I mean, Peter was ready to build shrines on this. I, I always wonder, so Peter, what do you do, charge a mission? You know, like Jewish thing, you know, <laughs> make a shrine. This is where Jesus and Moses and Elijah were. And, and we saw it and here, come here and visit the shrine. And they weren't there anymore. I mean, Jesus comes back down the mount with them. Moses and Elijah disappear. What are you going to build the building for? So you have some empty building to commemorate? This event, by the way, if you think that's a crazy idea, how many people have built buildings to commemorate events of something that happened? H has it been done in church history by, by, honestly, by Christians? Yes. We just love to build buildings for God. In fact, even David... David, when he was made king from being a shepherd boy to raised up by God to be the king of Israel, he says, oh God, I dwell in a house full of cedar with, with, with bronze and gold. And, and you, you God, have this little tabernacle, a tent, portable tent with the little Ark of the Covenant. You remember that? And the little layout that they had. And they got to carry it with poles. And he's like, I dwell in a great structure in you like he, he's God let me build you a house and you read about this in the book in, in the Kings in Samuel you, you find out that what's it say the Lord said no David you've been a man of bloodshed and, and besides that I'm not interested in you building me a house he says instead I will build you a house and the house that he t refers to is I will build you the house of salvation through your, through your loins will come the one who will redeem man. And he repeats to David the promise that he had given to, back to Adam when Adam sinned. He said, don't worry, through your seed will come one who will redeem mankind. Then he repeats it to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Jacob gets his name changed to Israel. Israel, we call it in English. And he becomes the the father of the 12 tribes. And through those tribes, down line comes this guy, David. This one that, you know, lots of people know about King David. Mostly his fault, you know. Fell with Bathsheba, 
sinned and everything. And yet, he, it says, God says, he, there was no one else like him. He was a man after God's own heart. And he wanted to build God a house, and God said, not interested, but I'll build you a house. Interesting to me, God's house he builds for David is one to deal with salvation of the world. Not a physical house. He's not interested in a physical house. In fact, did you know that the only temple God's really interested in for his spirit to dwell in, you know, that he would put his spirit in? Well, what's the building that he wants to put his spirit in? Our bodies. Paul wrote it to this church we're studying about today, 1 Corinthians. If you'll turn with me there to chapter 10, earlier in this book we went over this, but he's, Paul said, do you not know that your bodies are temple, a temple for the Holy Spirit of God. God wants to put His Spirit in you. Now, why would He want to put it in us and not in some physical building? You ever thought of that? Why, why did He put it in us, people, and not in, like, some, you know... Say it again? He's always with us, she says. Not only is He always with us, I, I submit to you it's so that His Spirit is now put in portable containers. I know some people don't think of it this way, but you know, how many people need a touch from God's Spirit and would never go to a church? Amen? Are there, I mean, literally, just because I'm preaching to you guys out on the beach, I pretty much know you're probably not the conventional churchgoers. Because generally I get the folks that are like not really building people coming out here to hang out with me. And they're like, you know, and some of them tell me right away, Pastor, this is my kind of church. The great outdoors, you know. How do you like this wallpaper? This is great. I mean, how many churches have a sailboat, you know, just for a little gussing up the wallpaper? I put that out there for you, right? And the waves and the rock. And, and one of the aunties told me, see the lion on the rock? He's kind of, his head is to the left and it's the, the back, and that's a lion rock right there. So you have the lion of the tribe of Judah hanging out behind you. You know, she told me this. Like the, the Hawaiian auntie, like this is, a, this is a blessing for you, you know. And you get this to look at. You see God's handiwork. All of this works for me. But what I found is that I'm not the only one. When Jesus preached, he preached in these beautiful places by the Sea of Galilee and and out in the desert, he'd take them to these oases at Caesarea Philippi. He spent time with his disciples in places just like this. If he was here today in Hawaii, I bet he'd be out here preaching. But he would be preaching not to build a building for him. He'd be preaching to have his spirit be in you. You're the building. And see, by putting it in you, if there's a need for somebody to be touched by God, they don't have to go to a church building to meet with God. Instead, God can send you the portable unit for His Spirit to them. And guys, whether you realize it, how many of you realize God has made divine appointments for you in your life? Where, where you could tell it, it was a setup. You did not plan this in your day. And all of a sudden, you run into someone and you're just like, wow, where did, how did that happen? I believe you're about to have a few more of those this week. This ballistic missile threat thing, the false alarm. You know, I grew up, my grandfather on my mom's side, he was a general at the Longpoke Air Force Base. I grew up one of those military brats. It's just part of my li life, you know. I thought, man, I got it made. Because when you go around with your grandfather is the general, like the highest ranking officer on the base, and you go to, with him to the commissary, or with grandma, his wife, do you know how well we got treated? I mean, everyone saluting us as we go by, and I was like, you know, hey, this is fun. He's he's cool. To have. Everyone respects. I mean, they they have to. I didn't know that. I just thought they're all really nice to my grandfather. And he would tell me stuff like, you know, stuff that ha my middle name is David after my after my uncle David, who was an Air Force pilot. He was killed when I was a young man. And he was, a, well, actually a young boy. I get word that my, my Uncle David died, 11 years old. He, he was, um, in, in our culture, he was my godfather. 
Like he's supposed to look after me, but then he dies, and yeah, I'm named that, uh, after him. So I'm like, oh, what happened? And my grandfather, my mom said, he's like, training exercise, son. Training exercise. Well, what happened? You know, I'm a kid. I want to know. Did it like fling him off the aircraft carrier into the ocean? And he goes, um, it wouldn't matter. It's always a training exercise. And he taught me things in the military, even if it wasn't a training exercise, it's called a training exercise because they don't tell you what was going on because they don't want you to know. It would freak you out. I won't be surprised in a week or two if they say, it was a training exercise. We couldn't tell you at the time. And by the way, because of this instant technology that we have with communication, it's really mucking up the the military's ability to pull off some of the stuff they used to do. They used to do these covert operations. You know, if that was a missile really coming at us and they shot it down, they're not going to tell you. They're going to say, training exercise. I'm just telling you, this is just how it is. Because what happens if they tell you the truth? Exactly oh, my God. If they told, if this was by chance, I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying by because of my military you know, exposure. Is it possible it was actually a real missile? And when it said, this is not a fake thing, this, is, this isn't a drill, you know, this is like get inside for real. And they send, out the, they send out the guys in charge of taking that thing out. And why didn't they respond in 38 minutes? Maybe because they're flying Mach 3 to get there to intercept and they don't have any word yet. Then pe people don't think about this. They had to actually jet out there and maybe take it out. And maybe we don't get word. And then, what are we going to say? Oh, sorry. False alarm. Now, if it was for real, they're not going to tell us. And if they do, it won't be for a long time. They'll be in some of them documentaries. <laughs> learning channel, right? A couple years from now. Declassified 10 years from now. Different administration. Oh, yeah. By the way, that was um, not really a drill or not really an accident. I mean, it could have happened. My question to you is, how did you respond in your faith when you heard it? I mean, what was your heart like? Is, is the reality that we have life after this death really in your heart as a, as a, a hope? that you have. Because the Bible teaches us that we're to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us whenever we are, what? Asked. You don't actually have to force it down people's throat. Trust me on this one. It doesn't work. It's much more effective when you wait till they ask you. So why aren't you freaking out? And you answer, because I have the hope of everlasting life. And even if this day is the last day I breathe air here, I already know God has a glorified body waiting for me. Glorified means like no more pain, no more sorrow. No, anyone up for upgrading? I mean, I call this true upgrading. We're going to trade in this body that you, some of you, you know what my pain is when I describe, when I look in the mirror, and I think that's not the real me what's looking back at me. I'm pretty sure I'm much better looking. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I have like more muscles and, and, and like, taller. and taller and you know. I mean, has anyone ever taught this besides me when you look in the mirror like that isn't the me that's inside. The, the, the reflection was there, that outward of reflection. That's not really who I am inside. Listen, someday, you will be clothed, your spirit will be clothed with a body, it says, made by God. Eternal in the heavens. And that body, that body, that will be the one you'll go, that's me. You'll be like, look at this. All shiny. Bright. You know, that, that, now, how many already know this? This is the hope we have as believers. We know that this is absent from the body. What does it say? Present, what? with the Lord. We don't have to really stress about this like some of the folks are stressing today. But let me show you something in today's 
passage, what we were coming to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that might help you to understand a dynamic that goes on in the different minds of folks that, you know, you, you're going to run into some folks and this could be a really life waking up altering event and other folks will be like, no big deal, life's same, as, same old, same old, and they won't change them at all. And I want to show you today from examples of Israel, the Bible is going to point out to us today that God had things happen to them. And today we find out in 1 Corinthians 10 why those things happen to them. And how can we, well, let, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 reads, For Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers, they were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from the spiritual rock which was following him. Following them. And what was that rock? It says right at the end of verse 4. And the rock was Christ. And nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened to them as examples for what? For us. These things happen to them for examples for us. So that it says, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Now this is something that, if you're not familiar with Jewish culture or Jewish history, the story of Moses, when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, this is the part of the, of the history timeline that Paul is alluding to when he talks about the children of Israel were all baptized into Moses. How were they baptized? Well, you guys remember, those, those of you that grew up, anyone see Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, let my people go, no, I'm not going to, yes, let them go, you know, plagues, the green mist, you know. I always thought that was a cool special effect when I was a kid. The Passover, you know, they're inside eating and that green stuff goes through the, city and it goes to and all the firstborn die remember and after that that was the that was the final straw that broke the pharaoh's back pharaoh finally relented and said all right you can go go worship your god in the wilderness and and what they didn't do in the movie was do a good job they didn't have enough extras because i don't know if you remember in the story the the israelites they start to leave egypt and they get to the red sea and it says the Lord put a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that was to guide them. And they were instructed with really simple instructions. You guys, when the pillar moves, you move. When the pillar stops, pitch camp, time to stop. I mean, it's pretty simplistic if you ask me. But, but I don't think some folks read the story to see how many folks were coming out of Egypt. Because if you watch Yul Brynner and Charlton Heston and the whole thing, it looks like, you know, like a couple hundred folks, right? They didn't have enough extras for that movie, right? You guys know this, right? Turn with me to Exodus just real quick, just so I can show. So, some folks are not familiar with this. So just to give you a little history lesson, maybe even a little bit more encouragement to your faith to see the enormous miracle God did when he pulled this off. He, he, he had the um, children of Israel there with Moses. And in, in um, Exodus chapter 12, we're told that they're to, to take of the lamb, go inside the house, and to slay the lamb. And they were to take the blood and take a um, branch and take the blood and what where were they supposed to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel that's the that top you know the two pieces at the side of the door the doorpost and the lintel the top part over the top of the door and they were to paint with a hyssop branch the blood of the lamb on there and and then they were to go inside the house and close the door and they were to take the lamb and to roast it and to eat of it 
How much were they supposed to leave left over of the lamb? Nothing. They said, if your family's not big enough to eat a whole lamb, get your neighbors. Come together, right? You all get together, and you're going to go in there. And why did they have to be inside with that blood of the lamb on the door? What was the big deal? You guys, I kind of gave it away with the green mist thing, but it was called the angel of death was going to come and visit the, the Egyptians. And everyone who did not have that covering of the blood of the lamb. Some of you are like, eh, you're really big on this blood of the lamb thing. I said, what was it that took away the sins of the world? What was the, what was the message John the Baptist said? Behold the, the what of God? The lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins. This is was all a foreshadowing of God showing off what was it going to cost to to pay for deliverance from bondage? See, the, the bondage that Israel was in to to the Pharaoh represents similar to the bondage we have in sin in our lives. And for us to be set free, well, it takes the it takes that that blood of a lamb to be sacrificed. And you say, why the why the blood? Well, it says the life is in the blood. And w what is the wages of sin? Death. How do you cover up death? Life. You have to use life to cover up death. This is just the way it goes. Sorry. Spiritual, this is like um, Sunday School 101. I know. But so, listen, how many c can relate that there was a time in your life you didn't know that? I mean, some of you can recall, you know, I didn't grow up knowing that. You get, you get exposed to that truth. You get to learn this. And so God was setting the example. And how often were the Jews commanded to celebrate this Passover deal? Was it just that one time in Egypt? Do the Jews today still celebrate the Passover? You talk about a perpetual testimony of the blood of the Lamb, like in your face. This is like, hey guys, you want to get delivered from bondage? You have to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the lintel, and you have to go inside. For it to count for the covering for your life, you have to go in and you have to partake of the lamb. Now, when Jesus was on this earth at the Last Supper, anyone remember what that Last Supper meal was he was eating with his disciples? Anyone recall the time of year it was or the Jewish, someone said it. What, what, what meal were they having? Passover. Passover. Oh, just coincidental. And then he takes the bread while they're at the table. And he says, this bread is my, what? Body, which is broken for you. Here, take. And he blesses it and he passes around. Eat. Why was he telling them to eat of his body? Because it was fulfilling the true Passover in their, in their midst. You know, all of this celebrating of this meal before this was just a foreshadow, a, a prophetic explanation of what the true Passover lamb would be. The one who would really come to be that bread of life. Come down from heaven. Isn't it interesting? Jesus, John tells us in his gospel that Jesus was the bread of life that has come down from heaven. And we have to eat of that bread to have life. Eat of me, he says. Now, he gives them the bread. And some of you are like, is he cannibalistic? I mean, this is kind of weird. And I said, look, he was still sitting there. It was a piece of bread. But he's explaining. You know, we're, 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 we're tactile learners, some of us. We do really good when they make the, the, the lesson something we can touch, taste, smell. You know, like Jesus, like, you guys need a little help here. So he takes the bread. This is, I'm the bread of life. Take this and eat of it. But he was explaining a truth. That this one, the Son of God, came down to this earth to give life to us. And we must partake of him and his sacrifice or we don't get counted in. Like what if you said, well, yeah, I heard that the Jews are doing this. Okay, you're in Egypt. But um, I don't think I really need to go into that house over there with those Jewish people and eat that lamb. I don't really, I'll just, sit, I'll just wait outside here on the porch. What would happen to you 
it, you guys read this in Exodus, right? What would happen to you if you were firstborn and you decided not to go in? You meet your maker that day. That's it. You die. This is this is this is like the most simplest example of why you need the lamb. Why you have to eat of the lamb. You, why you need the blood of the lamb so that you have his blood covering your death. Then he took the cup afterwards. He said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my what? In my blood. But it was a Passover meal. It would be the Passover, usually it's um, a, a wine. And he says, drink this. This is so you know my blood will be spilt for you. Now he said, this is the last time he was going to eat of this meal until he ate it anew. Anew. Where? In the kingdom of God. In heaven. He said, right now I'm going to have it with you last time on this earth, but until I eat it in its true fulfillment. Someday before God, we'll see this all. This is just an example to help us learn. But see, didn't Paul say all of this stuff was an example to help us learn? All this stuff that happened to Israel, just to teach us stuff so we can learn what God wants us to learn. And he says, these guys, they all ate of the food what God gave them to eat in the desert. They all shared the same food. What food did they eat? How many of you guys know this story? Showed up every morning on the ground. Says it was like hoarfrost on the ground. Like manna. <laughs> Manna. You know Hebrew? For those of you that don't know Hebrew, manna means what is it? <laughs> That's all it is. It's what it means. What is it showed up? What is it? I don't know, but it's... Let me try it. Tastes like honey. Like, like fine, like coriander seed. And it says they could grind it. They could mill it. They could make manapuas. And banana pancakes? And I don't know. I mean, I'm just being creative. I, they, how long did they eat this food that showed up in the desert for them every day? 40 years. That's a lot of manna. That's a lot of manna. I'm sure they got creative after a while. You think manna shevitz is a new thing? I'm sure it just came from <laughs> some real thing they made up in 40 years in the wilderness. But they had this every day. And, and it says also... They had to drink water, living water that came from a rock. A rock that Moses was told, go first and smite the rock. One time when you smite it, it will give forth water for you to drink. And he smote the rock. Now the second time that the people cried out for water, the Lord told Moses, go and speak to the rock and it will give water. But Moses was mad. You know what he did? He struck the rock. A second time and the Lord didn't take issue with the people the Lord took issue with Moses Moses why are you making it look like I'm mad at the people for wanting to drink I'm not mad at them I told you speak to the rock but what did it say in first Corinthians chapter 10 that that rock was what that rock was Christ that was following them in the desert giving them water and what did Jesus say to the woman at the well when he said give me a drink and she said Sir, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. We don't even talk. And he said, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for what? Living water that you would thirst no more. I'd give you living water. And she's like, oh, evermore, give me that. I won't have to come to this well. She wanted that living. Didn't she want that living water? And yet the rock that followed them in the wilderness, it says, was Jesus, the Christ. And he was the one. And you ever wonder why God was so mad about Moses hitting the rock the second time? I believe there's no wasted things in Scripture. There's a, re there's a reason why the first time the rock was smitten for the water to flow. The second time he said, all you have to do now is what? Just speak to the rock. But Moses was mad. He hit the rock again. Does Jesus need to be smitten over and over for living water? No. Only once. Once he had to be sacrificed. He had to hang on that cross. And at that end, what was the last three words he said? It is what? Finished. 
Done. Finito. It's done. Finished. Don't have to do that anymore. It's all good. And this was a type. This was things that happen for our example. Now, we learn well from examples, don't we? It's nice to have examples. But in this example, interestingly enough, they were told to go in and have the lamb and that God was going to deliver them in Exodus 12. And, and, the, and the Lord says that, that he would lead them out of this place into a land with, with milk and honey that he had for them. And so the Lord, he, he gives these instructions. And if you have time tonight, just, just to fill in um, the portion what we're, we're studying in 1 Corinthians, Paul is basically summing up say, from Exodus 11 to Exodus 16 in the first few verses we just read. He's going to go a little farther than that and even into Numbers uh, for next week's sermon if you want to read ahead. But, but just so you know, he, he has the people um, come, come and in Exodus 12, verse 37, it says, Now the sons of Israel, when, when, when the Egyptians finally said, you know, you can go, they journeyed from Ramses, Ramses to, to Succoth. There was about 600,000 men on foot, aside from the children. 600,000 men. Do they count the women, by the, by the way, for Jewish census? No. Just the men. Sorry, gals. Not, not, nothing against you. Just They were considered like husband and a wife becomes what? Two become one. So if you count the guys, you just double the number to get the, the number for the girl, basically. You know, like this is the, the uh, uh, men of the age of war. If you want the exact number, go to the book of Numbers. Joshua goes ahead and, and lists it. 603,550 men, all the number according to the head of household by their tribes, everything listed out. That's, by the way, only the men of the age of war. That doesn't count children, okay? doesn't count, you know, the little boys, little girls. It also does not count something really interesting. It says, and a mixed multitude also went up with them along with, this is Exodus 12, 38, along with flocks and herds and a very large number of livestock. When they leave Israel, there's an, a conservative estimate. The historians say at least two and a half million People. That's why that's why the movie guys didn't have enough extras for the movie. I mean they didn't have the CGI technology that Spielberg, you know, developed with Star. Today they need to remake that movie. And because you guys seen the part, right? When, when 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 Moses is told put your staff out and touch the sea and it'll become dry ground and does anyone else besides me when you were a kid watching that? Because I already knew the end of the story. I knew that the, that the Lord was going to keep back, he was going to keep back Pharaoh's army and Moses and all the children of Israel are going to get to go through, it says, on dry ground. I knew this from Sunday school. Did anyone else learn this, by the way? God would make dry ground for the Israelites to cross the sea. Well, I'm watching the movie and the water heaps up. It was a pretty cool special effect for back then, you know? They had the water on each side and Look kind of like a canyon of water, and, and, and you're like you're kind of like peeking, hoping you see some fish, you know, swimming by, and and, and you're thinking, and, and and the extras run in, and there's some rocks, and they're climbing over, and they get, and they get all the way across, and 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 you just know, when the cloud moves out of the way, that they're gonna go rushing in to go get the Israelites, and and the Pharaoh's gonna go now uh, in the book. It says Pharaoh takes his 600 choice chariots, all of his, we, we call the super soldiers of the Egyptian army, and he goes after them. He's angry. And you can read about this just in, the, in this uh, next couple chapters here. And he chases them. And it was God with that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire holding them back. Sorry, you don't get to get at it. Now, anyone in your... Sunday school mine used to picture like a pillar like I don't know what three feet eight feet 
Do you think a three foot pillar or an eight foot pillar? How about 10 feet? These tents are 10 by 10. How about a 10 foot pillar? Is that big enough to keep Pharaoh's army from going around and getting you? How big do you think that pillar was? In here, but it got to be like, you know, three, four miles. How would you like to have a pillar of cloud three or four miles across going from the earth to heaven as a sign from God? Where do I go? I know some of you are like, I wish God would just show me where to go. <laughs> right? I mean, has anyone ever thought this in your life at any point in your journey? I just wish the Lord would just make it clear. So I would know. I mean, couldn't he just cheat a little and do like the whole Moses thing? What, you need a four mile pillar? Across? Going from the earth to heaven and when it moves, you move? You're like, yeah, give me one of those. You know what's interesting? Over a couple million people were led by that pillar. They were protected by it first so the Pharaoh's army couldn't get to them. And then when the pillar moved out of the way, after they were safely across, by the way, in one night, one day, the Jewish culture, they say, they start at 6 p.m., go to the following six but that's one one night one day 24 in they're, they're across they're on the other side and the and the pillar moves whoop, out of the way and Pharaoh uh, you'd think he'd be going this is a trap except if it was a three mile gap and you got 600 chariots would it really feel that scary no he'd be like plenty of room we can go let's chase them Pursue everybody after them. And they go to pursue, and you guys know the rest of the story. What does the Lord allow to happen to the waters? It comes back. Now, I hate this because what well, says here, even though they all had this experience of this great deliverance, this mighty deliverance of God, yet they did not believe. You'd think like some super big miracle would like, for a whole nation would be like a spiritual national wake-up call. They'd all be like, man, God is awesome. He's real. Look, the pillar's right there. He's leading us. You'd think there'd be like a revival or something, national revival. Everyone's spiritually in tune that God is, is present and leading them and guiding them and providing for them and giving them food and giving them more. angel food, manna. They get in it every day. They're getting water from the rock. That happens all the time, right? And by the way, how many times does a rock follow you through the desert? It says the rock followed them. That, that's, yeah, just jump. The, the pillar moves, the rock moves. And they're taking care. You think somebody would wake up and go, this is pretty supernatural. I think there's a God. Yet, how many of them came to believe? Paul is telling us, yet with many of them, God was not pleased. Even though he did great things, it didn't make them turn to him. And if you ever wonder why, when God does some miraculous things, even in some of your family members' lives, he's, he's done miracles to pr protect them and, and to deliver them from things, and they're like, I still don't believe in God. And you're like, can't you see the, the great things he's done to, to look out for you? So, that happens for everyone. It happens for everyone because God is really real for everyone. But somehow some people are like this. I don't see it. Now Paul is going to identify why don't they see it. Why don't they see that great hand of God delivering? Why don't they see that great hand of God providing? He says because they crave evil things. When you're busy craving evil, you don't see the good even if it's right in front of your face, you become spiritually blind to the reality. It's there. Oh, it, it's still there. You just don't see it. It's like you put on spiritual sunglasses that block out the light. You're walking in darkness and you go, yeah, I got this evil glasses here. And you put them on and I don't see God. He's blocked out because of a craving in your heart for evil. 
It doesn't change the fact that God is doing great miracles for people. It doesn't change the fact that God is providing day after day people's food every day, people's living water every day, people's forgiveness of their sins through the blood of the Lamb every day. But when people crave evil, they don't see it. And I can give the best sermon ever given. I, I'd be like, be like on point, all the points. Not even lose my place once. And people walk away going, no, I didn't get nothing out of that today. That preacher, he's out to lunch, man, talking some stories about seas parting. And, you know, that's so stupid. Hey, do you know <laughs> there was this institute of, quote, higher learning that said that whole thing with the sea parting, we, we can prove that that just was a natural phenomena of a wind blowing through the valley, and they made a mock-up model of their version of the Red Sea. It was really interesting. And in their mock-up, did any of you guys see this on the Learning Channel? They made a little shelf under the bed of the Red Sea, and they put this really high-powered fan, and they blew, aimed the fan just at the spot on the sea, like a, in a, like, they kind of flattened out the flow of air in a laminar, you know, sheet, so it blew really strong. And what they did, is really cute. They made it in their model, the water blow back to one side. And because that little shelf that was underneath in the model, the water heaps up on one side. And they're like, see, with just a strong wind all night, blew the water back. And then, and then when the wind stopped the next day after they got across, the water returned. And they did the whole thing. They, 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 they like had lights on it and showed it worked. And see, we can explain how this happened. And, and the children of Israel just crossed through on a land bridge that was actually hiding under 18 inches of water. That, that's, they had to use 18 inches of water because if it was any deeper, the, the little flow wouldn't work. So they had the model working. And when it was scaled to full size, it would have been 18 inches deep. In their model, by the way, it was like about a quarter inch of water that they blew back. But they're saying, we're, we're trying to you know, explain the phenomena. I said, wow, that's even more miraculous than the story I read in the Bible. And they're like, what? I said, yeah. Because in the Bible, it records that all of the Egyptian army, those 600 chariots with all their bad boy soldiers or the Green Berets of the day, charged in after. And, and if I go with what you said in your surmisings that there was a land bridge and it was only 18 inches deep and they charged across the sea and they chased the children of Israel and then the water returned, then these Egyptians were idiots because they drowned in 18 inches of water. Yeah, exactly. Let me see, 18 inches, that's about uh, right there. It's a cubit, one cubit. That's, by the way, for you guys that don't know what a cubit is in, in biblical recording, from the tip of a man's finger to his elbow, foot and a half. They didn't have tape measures. Black and Decker hadn't come out yet. So when they measured, they went here to here, one cubit, two cubit, three. It was one cubit, they drowned. According to scientists of today, you talk about an even bigger miracle than the miracle what God described is that they all drown in that much water. Does anyone think it's easier to believe the real story in the Holy Scripture than what the scientists surmise? I'm like, come on. I'll go with what the good book says. Good book says God took them out. Now, I don't think, is it hard for God to move water? No. He's like, I created the whole heavens and the earth and the sea and all the things, and I can't move a little bit of water? Is, think about in relation to the guy we're talking about, the creator of the universe. A little bit of water? Oh, man, that's tricky. I don't think so. Jesus shows that God has mastery over all this stuff we look at. Even when Jesus... In that storm, he told the disciples, cross the other side, and they rode all night. They didn't get there. And he goes walking by. <laughs> like, what? It's a ghost. There's a guy walking. Look on the storm right there on the water. And Jesus says, it's not a ghost. It's me. And what did Peter say? I love Peter. 
If I was going to go back and hang with any of them, it would be Peter. He got to see the transfiguration. I'd be like, Peter, can I just be your, your buddy? I'm just going to hang with you. And he's the only one, by the way, of the 12 that said, if it's really you, Lord, bid me what? Come to you. And the Lord goes, okay, come. Now, who can tell me what happened to Peter when he stepped out of the boat? While he was with his eyes on Jesus, the Bible says he walked on water until he looked at the storm. He took his eyes off the Lord, and that's when, oh, save me, I'm drowning. You know, by the way, it's the same for us. In the storms of life, when our eyes are on Jesus, even if there's a ballistics missile alert, if your eyes are on Jesus, guess what? You're good, man. You're golden. You can walk on water. Don't have the stress. But if your eyes are not on the Lord, you deserve to freak out. Wake up, man. This is a spiritual wake-up call. Because the storm is real, and the storm will drown you. Without a Savior, you're going down. But see, in the story, God provided His Son to save you. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I can tell, like, all the heads nodding, like, yeah. You already know you're going to be saved because you already called on the name of the Lord. But the Bible says if you haven't done so yet, it says, let anyone who, who is perishing call on the name of Jesus. It promises, if you call on the name of the Lord, what will he do? He'll save you. Just like Peter in that story. Lord, help, I'm drowning. Oh, Peter, ye of little faith. But did he say, oh, ye of little faith, and let him drown? No, ye of little faith, and he put him back in the boat. What did you think? I told you guys, get across the other side. If the Lord tells you to do something, like go over there, and even if there's storms, if he says you're going over there, guess what? You're going. Storm or no storm, he will get you there. It's just his style. I have Some of you have already realized this in your Christian experience, that when the Lord tells you to do something, even if it seems like not to the natural mind possible, like to a, a young couple... In our, in our 20s, you two go to Hawaii and plant a church. But we don't have anything, Lord. We don't even have tickets. You go. I don't know how. But if you say, then okay. And I went to men's prayer. Guys, I don't know how, but the Lord had that guy Wally tell me to go to Hawaii. And, and I know it's not Wally because he wouldn't tell a fly to get off his hamburger at a picnic so polite and he's telling me to go that ain't him that's not even him that's and, that, and I, even when i pointed that out to the lord that's how i pointed out lord what is wally's problem there's this guy from in our church in arizona born and raised in hilo hawaii i'd never been to hilo hawaii and he keeps coming up to me going you have to go to the big island because you're chill they'll be able to they'll be able to hear from you the gospel the, you know you, the way you explain you go and I'm like, Lord, what is Wally's problem? He wouldn't tell anyone. I mean, he wouldn't tell a fly to get off his hamburger. I said that to the Lord. And he's telling me to go to Hawaii. And the Lord goes, it isn't him, dummy. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm just speaking through. Can God speak through somebody into your life? He was trying to tell me something. And I went to men's prayer. Guys, Wally says I have to go to the Big Island. Well, it might be God. I just want to find out. Would you guys pray with me? Within two weeks, we had, we had these buddy passes from America West. Seven of them. Only needed me and Jan were two. I goes, nope, you're going to go a couple times. And I was like, my big objection was, I can't afford the flight. God goes, how about seven tickets? Is that enough? I'm like, all right, all right, all right, we'll go, we'll go. You know, when God says do something, he isn't going, I can't work this out. I can't do it. He can have nothing and still feed millions in the desert. Oh, you know, one other part of that story I didn't get to point out yet. I'll do it next week. I hope I will recall to do it. But what happened with their clothing for 40 years in the desert? They stop by the store and get extras. 
What store was there in the desert? The Bible says that not even their sandal thongs wore out. How'd you like have the same sandals for 40? You girls are going, I hate this story. I like new shoes every week. I have shoes I've never even worn yet in the closet. But, but these folks wore the same slippers for 40 years, and God made sure they did not wear out. The same clothing did not wear. Now, some of you are going, oh, this is terrible. But this just shows that God can make things happen in the supernatural way to take care of you in the natural realm. When you say, give me this day my daily bread, like Jesus taught us to pray, do you think he'll take care of you? I mean, can he really pull off what you need to eat? What you need for your provision. By the way, daily bread is daily portion in Hebrew. It's whatever you need for that day. It's not just talking about the stuff goes in your mouth. It's talking about all your needs. God is Jehovah Jireh. He supplies all that we need. He, from our salvation to all that we need for this life if we follow him. Even down to the comfort in my heart when I get weird texts on the phone. And I can go, you know, it's nice to serve a living God that gave me hope of life everlasting. And no matter what happens, I'm good. I'm good. Now, if you don't have that assurance today and you want it, you want to make sure that you're, you're walking in that living hope. Herb, would you raise your hand? That's our chaplain up at the hospital, Herb. And that man loves God and, and he is a real dear prayer warrior. He prays for people to get healed, and God does cool things. And he suffers in his own body pain, and yet God uses him to help other people. And I, I just marvel at the mercy of God in this man's life. And he, he'll be available. I'll be available. Tim, would you mind joining me if we need prayer? If anyone needs prayer, we got Raj, would you help us too? If, we, if, if you need prayer, we'll be around. We'll go to the table. You stay there, Herb. If you need prayer, that'll be the prayer table today. And, uh, and just come. And if you want to make sure that you're right with God so that you, you, you get to, will have the assurance what I'm talking about, this hope in my heart. Now, even when I die, I'm not dying. If they report on the, in the news, Pastor Izzy died, you, you send in a retraction, tell him, you, you, you got it wrong. He didn't die, he moved. He moved from his earthly body, he upgraded to a heavenly one. Change of address. But I didn't die. I got a spirit in here. It's never going to die. And so do you. God made you with a living spirit in your... And you know what's weird? People know it inside. They can feel it. What, what disturbs them is if they don't know where that spirit's going to go after they die. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus made a way so you could go back to God. He is the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Now some people go... I don't like that. You're narrow-minded. I said, you don't like it. Take it up with him. I didn't make it up. I'm just, the, I, I just like proclaim what he said. Don't get mad at me if I tell you what he said. I'm just telling you. That's what he said. Don't like it? Take it up with Jesus. Just tell him, I'm mad at you for being the only way. Work it out with him. I'm sure he'll work with you. But, but it's not me being narrow-minded. It's Jesus said that the way is broad. And many are there, thereupon that leads to where? To destruction. The way is narrow and straight that leads to eternal life. Someone gave me this poster once. It was pretty cool. It had this like picture of a cross laying as a pathway across this chasm. And down below was all this fiery hell. And there was a broad road where all these souls were like falling off down this broad road into the hell. And, and, there, and then the, and the little cross with a narrow straight way across to this glorious paradise on the other side. And there's only a few people crossing this bridge of the cross. And there was one little dude in the picture by the foot of the cross, right by where the wide part people were falling. And he's going like this, come on, get over on this narrow part. And this person brought me this poster and they said, Pastor, I'm giving you this poster because when I saw this, you see the little stick man right here where he's grabbing the other people off the broad road and pulling them onto the straight road? That's you. You're always trying to get people off the wrong way and getting them on the right track. 
I said, good. That's a good reminder. I, pu I put that thing in my office when I had an office, right behind my, my head. When people would be talking to me, I'm like, see this little dude? That's me. See that dude right there? That's you. You don't want to go that way. See where it goes? Boop. H-E double two picks. No, don't go there. Get on this road. Take the cross. Take the way of salvation. Because Jesus paid a lot to make it so you could get to heaven. He did. And if you don't know that, you talk to Aaron, her, Brett over there, those guys, they will share with you the message I'm talking about. And you need to make sure you get right with God. Today, the Bible says, is a great day, acceptable day of salvation. This would be a good day for you to, to get it taken care of. Get your spiritual affairs in order so you know what will happen. And you don't have to be freaked out the next time you get one of them text alerts. You'd be like, is all chill. Hey, man, today we're going to heaven, maybe. What was weird is I was sitting there going, I can only wish. I just had this feeling. Anyone else have a feeling like inside, like, ain't going to. Yeah. The Lord's going, you ain't done. You still got to <laughs> preach tomorrow. I'm like, darn. I could have been like, no, you know. How many times have I been preaching and telling people, get ready. You know, we don't know when. I mean, what if the Lord returns? Are you ready for that? And, and every time it's cloudy, I think, it says his coming will be in the clouds. It could be today. Wait, there's a few out there. He could just part those clouds and show up. And now, if he would do it right now for me, that would be so nice. My last sermon ever preached, I'm telling you, the Lord's going to return, and then he shows up. And I go, see, for eternity you'd be hating me. I told you. I I, I, see, I don't know the day or the hour, but I do know the event is coming. The signs of the times, man, they're for sure happening. We, do we have wars? Rumors of wars? Pestilence, famines, earthquakes? My wife just tells me. What was it this morning? 7.1 7, 7 in Peru this morning, right right on her way. She, she goes, honey, we have to pray for the people in Peru. Let's close with prayer for them, shall we? Father, we, we come to you thanking you that, well, I thank you we're on a beach in Hawaii, not in Peru right now. But I pray for all of the folks whose lives have just been turned upside down by this earthquake, that you would bring them comfort from your spirit, that you would bring them, well, even messengers of salvation that would share the good news what we just visited, so that they would not be cut off from this earth without knowing you. Lord God, thanks for the great hope we have in our faith. Just let it sink into our beings for this week. Let us be ones that can share it with others that need it. Lord, let, let these words just enrich our hearts as we prepare for this week. Lord, you know what we're going to face. So just be with us, lead us, and guide us. And fill us to overflowing with your Spirit's comfort, your peace, your love. And in Jesus, your precious Son's name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.